Hello, I'm Chris Lee of Southeastern 14 here to do baseball previews for the coming weekend. That's going to be games that start Friday, April the 19th. We have done the two series that start Thursday in a separate video. So the series we're going to be going over and offering previews and predictions, and I will do these in order that the SEC lists them on their website, Arkansas at South Carolina, Auburn at Mississippi State, Ole Miss at Georgia, LSU at Missouri, Tennessee at Kentucky. Before we get into those, we remind you, BetOnline is your number one source for all your summer sports this season, from Major League Baseball to golf, the NBA and NHL playoffs, all the latest stats, news, and scores available to follow on your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds on just about every sport out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on all the action. Bet online where the game starts. We will start in Columbia, South Carolina, where Arkansas, having lost its first series of the season, will face South Carolina in Founders Park in Columbia. Again, that one starts Friday night. The scheduled starters, according to the SEC website, no surprise for Arkansas. Hagan Smith, Mason Molina, Brady Tigert. For the Gamecocks, things have been a little bit more fluid. They'll go Roman Kimball, Eli Jones, and to be determined. Let's start with Arkansas in this one. The Razorbacks, of course, more known for their pitching. I mean, God help you if you can find a better pitching staff in the country than this one. Uh, Arkansas with, with Hagan Smith has just been a monster. You know, maybe a pitcher of the year candidate nationally. Mason Molina, the Texas Tech transfer, has been pretty good. Brady Tigart, not as good as the other guys, but hey, it's Arkansas's rotation we're talking about here. Probably the best in the country. And after that, the, the bullpen. I mean, my goodness, it's just sick how much these guys have. Will McIntyre has been that closer slash bulk inning reliever that Dave Van Horn likes. Free pass rate, which is walks plus uh, hit by hit batsman 4% of hitters. So that's one in every 25 hitters that Will McIntyre faces are getting a free pass. And, oh, by the way, he's striking out a third of the hitters he faces, which is very much like what this whole Arkansas staff does. You look at the strikeouts. Hagan Smith, 49%. Mason Molina, 36%. Uh, McIntyre, 33%. Gabe Gackle, 33%. Gage Wood, 39%. Uh, Cooper Dossett, when he pitches, 40%. I mean, we can just go on and on and on. They've got 13 or 14 arms they can throw. The lineup, not quite as potent, but Jared Sprague Lott's having a nice year. Nolan Souza's played well lately. Um, Kendall Diggs has been a solid guy for that lineup. Not having a great year, but he's been a, a bat that people in the league know. And Peyton Stovall is producing at a nice level, too, after missing some time early with injury. So the lineup is not really what carries Arkansas. It's the pitching and the fact that this team does not give up a lot of unearned runs, uh, which cannot be said of all teams in college baseball. Let's go to the Gamecocks for a minute. They'll be hosting where they've been pretty good at home this year. They've swept Vanderbilt. They've lost two of three against Texas A&M, but you can say that of a lot of teams. And those have been the two conference series this team has played so far. The bats, I think, have been a little disappointing. It's not a bad lineup. I just expected maybe a little bigger numbers from Ethan Petrie, who's been great, but he's not up there with some of the other guys in the league at the top, the Cagliones. He's capable of that, though. You got Cole Messina. You got Gavin Cassis is kind of having a down year. But here's the point. This team can really rake when it is on. And so – Arkansas's challenge will just be keeping the ball in the park. You got Petri, 15 home runs. Cole Messina's got 10. This is a team that can launch them at times. Now, the, the pitching is going to be the interesting thing, I think, for South Carolina. They're going Kimball and Jones. Jones has been good at times, but not a dominant, overpowering strikeout guy, more of a keep the ball on the ground guy. I presume Dylan Eskew will be their three, uh, maybe, but they haven't announced that. Um, they got a lot of guys out of the bullpen that can give them innings and Veach and Becker and guys like that. Tyler Pitcher, who's been a lefty starter for them, or excuse me, righty freshman, who's given them some innings at times in a starting role. I guess he'll be coming out of the bullpen this weekend, likely. They've got a lot of arms here. My, my prediction, I think that Arkansas will win the series just because you kind of go with what you know a little bit more. And I think despite Arkansas' stumble, last weekend against Alabama, 
I like the town a little bit better. I always tend to lean pitching. Don't sleep on South Carolina. This is a team I think is a little better than people think and one that's got a chance to pull the series upset at home. Next up, Auburn goes to Mississippi State. My goodness, it's just been a tough season for Auburn. Let's look at the five series Auburn's played, and you tell me whether this is a, a bad team or a team that just played a buzzsaw of a schedule. At Vandy, Arkansas, at A&M, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Uh, Auburn has won two games in that, one coming against Arkansas, one coming against Tennessee. Uh, the Tigers do come off a midweek win against Georgia. And the lineup, the, the, the middle of the order, top of the order guys, and Ike Irish, Cooper McMurray, uh, Mason Manners is a guy who's had a good year and left for them, the Jacksonville State transfer. This team can hit at times. Uh, the problem has been the pitching. It's just been very, very hard to find def dependable arms here. Joseph Gonzalez is not the guy that he was pre-injury. Uh, you know, probably their best guy is John Armstrong out of the bullpen, the righty side armor. They've got some other guys that have got some talent. Christian Herberholz has done some things at times, uh, but it's just not gone Auburn's way pitching wise. And and look, a lot of teams have had struggles pitching in the league this year. Uh, and Auburn hardly the, the least of those teams, or maybe it is, I don't know the, the numbers haven't been great, but Auburn is going to go Dylan Watts, Tanner Bauman, and I think Carson Myers, I'm guessing could get the, the third start, but we'll wait and see what they do. Um, yeah, that's actually what Auburn's announced. So Myers is the UAB transfer. So they'll go righty, lefty, lefty in this one. Mississippi State, a team I think is maybe a little bit underrated nationally. Um, it, it's not a lineup, I think, that's had the season that maybe people have expected outside of Dakota Jordan. Now, look, it's a good lineup, but Hunter Hines has not had the, the kind of year we thought Hunter Hines would have. Same with Imani Larry. They're fine. David Marchand stepped up and had a nice year for them. It's short offensively, but the pitching, this has really been a turnaround for State. Uh, Kai Steffen, their Friday start of the Purdue transfer has been really good, not giving up a lot of runners, keeps guys off base in terms of issuing walks and free passes. Drangelo St. Joe, their switch pitcher, I think will be in the number two. I guess Evan Sieri will be the three, could be Carson Ligon. I don't know. Nate Dom, and boy, this would really change the complexion of the rotation. I guess Dom, it appears, is injured. They haven't given much of an update on him that I can find. He's one of the more talented arms on that staff. If you put him in there and he's healthy, this might be one of the best rotations in the conference. Now, the bullpen, I'm probably not up to par with the rotation, but the rotation guys have given them good innings, and I think the bats are due to be a little bit better. This game, or this series, rather, in Starkville, I'm going to go with Mississippi State. I think it's the better team, and in this case, in this case, also the home team. Next up, in Athens, Ole Miss visits Georgia. Ole Miss got a series win over Mississippi State last week after winning, after, excuse me, after losing the Friday game, and it faces the Georgia team, I think, that is 22-2 and at home and can really hit the long ball. Number two nationally, I think one home run behind Tennessee, at least that was the case, heading into the midweek game. Ole Miss will go Riley Maddox, Liam Doyle, that's righty-lefty, and to be determined in game three. Georgia will go Leighton Finley, Christian Maronka, and I think Charlie Goldstein, who's been there one, has been out for about three weeks with a, what's been called a, a tired arm, as I'm told. But let's start on the Ole Miss side. Feels like Ole Miss got a little life winning that series last weekend against Mississippi State. This is a team that, that's got some pop. A couple of the transfers, Andrew Fisher, lefty in his first year from Duke, and he, he, Duke, excuse me, Ethan Groff, his second year at Ole Miss after transferring to, from Tulane. Excuse me, Ethan Leger. He's hit 11 homers. Fisher's hit 13. The problem for Ole Miss has just been the pitching. JT Quinn's been on the shelf for a while. Don't know when he's coming back. Um, Riley Maddox, Liam Doyle, neither have been great so far. The third spot's been kind of a mystery. I think probably the best part of that staff so far have been Mason Nichols in relief. Uh, he's a little bit wild, but he's been pretty good in terms of keeping runners off base and keeping the ball in the park. Mitch Morell, also a guy that's been there a while, has given him a lift. But Ole Miss has just had trouble finding enough innings from enough guys at times, and that, that's been this problem. It's a decent hitting team. But Ole Miss is going to have to find some pitching if it wants to go in in Athens and win a series. And that is the problem when you're playing Georgia. 
Um, everybody knows about Charlie Condon. He's got 24 home runs, might be national player of the year, uh, depending on what you do with Jack Caglione, who's putting up big hitting numbers and also big pitching numbers, or at least nice pitching numbers for Florida. But Condon is creating runs at about a 25 runs per 27 outs clip, uh, which is just incredible. And it's not just him hitting bombs. You got Corey Collins has hit 12 and might be the most underrated player in the league so far. He's got an on base percentage of 582. He's slugging 888, got 12 bombs, has been there seemingly forever. Uh, Colby Branch has got 10 home runs, slugging 570. Fernando Gonzalez out of the catcher spot has got six bombs. Uh, Dylan Goldstein, uh, their outfielder, I think he plays right, has got nine bombs. This is the team that just got guys that hit them up and down the lineup and also guys on the bench that, that can come off and, and give you some pop, too, uh, like Dylan Carter when he's not in the lineup. Now, the issue for Georgia, again, going to be the pitching. This staff right now without Goldstein goes about seven deep. Now, Jarvis Evans have been pretty good lately. Um, Leighton Finley is going to be the, the guy that gets the ball in game one. He's been pretty good, keeps the ball on the ground, uh, 25% ground ball rate. That's the all outs, not just strikeout or not just balls put in play, but he gets ground balls at a 25% rate, which is pretty good. And boy, you need that when you're pitching in fully field, the way the ball gets out of there. Uh, the problem for them is they hadn't had great relief. Uh, Brian Zeldin, uh, the transfer from Penn, the right, he's been pretty good for them. Uh, but it's kind of been six, seven, eight guys. And after that, um, hold your breath. Uh, and some of those performances have not been very pretty so far. But when you score the way Georgia has, this team scored 346 runs this year, scored 109 in SEC play. I think both teams have got pitching issues. I just trust Georgia's lineup in that park where it's just been a monster this year to win that series. Next up, LSU goes to Missouri. Now, here is a series that's infinitely more interesting than I would have thought it would have been coming into the season. Everybody pegged Missouri consensus last in the SEC, myself included. I think everybody thought LSU was going to be a national title contender. Guess what? LSU's won three SEC games, and Missouri's won five. And, and, and Missouri, frankly, has it's, it's gotten better as the season has gone on. I'll get into that in just a minute. LSU has switched up the rotation a little bit. It's going to go gauge jump. The lefty transfer from UCLA, who's been a little bit erratic, uh, a, a good starter, one that most teams would have in the rotation. I don't think the performance has been quite up to maybe what the Tigers had hoped. Luke Holman in the two spot uh, has been a first-team All-SEC type guy this year. He's been pretty dominant. And so anytime Luke Holman's on the mound, you feel like LSU's going to have a chance. After that, I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. Thatcher Hurd has been hit and miss. Um, you know, when, when he is on, he is really, really good. And, and they've got some other guys. Gavin Guidry's a nice arm. Uh, but you got some relievers out of that pen. Uh, Justin Lohr, Nate Ackenhusen, lefties have not been, I think, what they hope. Griffin Herring's been fine. But it, it seems like this team's got about three or four arms it can count on a lot of weekends. And look, LSU hardly alone in this. There's a lot of other teams in the league that are in that boat. But I think the pitching has been a little bit of a disappointment so far. Now, now the lineup has been a little bit, too, to be frank. Uh, Tommy White has not quite had the year that I think people expected, but everybody knows he's an All-American and a major league caliber third baseman. By the way, the defense has improved for him when I've watched this year, so there's also that. But Jared Jones really has been their best hitter this year. But other than that, other guys really hadn't stepped up. Michael Bradwell, Braswell's been hit and miss. Seems like Mac Bingham has tailed off a little bit lately. Paxton Kling didn't take that jump up. Brady Neal really has it. Now, Hayden Travinsky behind the plate's been really good uh, from an offensive standpoint. And he's one of three guys with double-digit home runs. But um, just not the guys you, you expected a big freshman to soft, sophomore step up from this lineup that, that didn't happen. Now for Missouri, I think Missouri right now, one of the more interesting teams in the league because I think everybody felt like this was the league's worst team coming into the season. You got a coach rebuilding the worst program in the league with a lot of new faces, and I think this is the team that has competed every weekend, and Carrick Jackson's got a lot out of this bunch because it's very limited offensively. Outside of Trevor Austin, who's got nine home runs, 
Not a lot of guys in that lineup that scare you. Danny Corona, the Wake Forest transfer, really hasn't had the year that I think we all thought he would have. He's been playing some first for them. Uh, Jackson Beeman, their right fielder, um, has had a nice year, a little bit of a breakout. And Jackson Lovich at DH has had a nice season too. But th the bottom half of that lineup, a um, lot been a lot of easy outs in there so far. But here's the interesting thing about Missouri. The pitching has really stepped up. Um, Logan Lunsford's going to be their, their Friday guy. Javin Pimentel, the lefty in the two slot, has been really good lately when I've seen him. Uh, he's a little bit tricky, keeps the ball on the ground. Uh, walks a few guys, but strikes some out too. I think between him, Carter Rustad, and I would presume would be the three or maybe a, a bulk inning relief guy if it's a high leverage game in game one or two. But Rustad's given them a lot of innings, could be their three. Uh, Bryce Mayer, the Juco transfer, also thrown a lot of innings. He could be a guy that you could see some bulk work at. Um, Ryan Magic, lefty out of the pen, has been really good lately. 33% strikeout rate. Um, just has been really tough to hit. I've seen him pitch a little bit. I, I think that Missouri is limited. LSU's got a lot more depth, uh, but Missouri has kind of held teams down lately on the mound a little bit more than you would have thought. Going back to Vandy three weekends ago, saw them here in person in Nashville, and they they really held Vanderbilt's lineup down. They just couldn't score. They go and, and they get Florida at home. They sweep that series, three one-run games, and then they go to Georgia and, and what is a tough matchup for them because Missouri is not equipped to go power for power with a team like Georgia in a small ballpark, and yet Missouri hung with Georgia through the weekend, got the middle game, and took two losses on the, the Friday and the Saturday games, or that could have been a Thursday-Sunday series. I don't remember. But anyway, games one and three were the games that Missouri lost, uh, but they were competitive in those games. I see a team that's gotten a lot better – Remember, this is the only team in the league that's beaten Kentucky so far for what that's worth. You know, I, I kind of like Missouri uh, to take the series since it's at home um, and it's playing well. Uh, LSU is going to have to get it together quickly. That, that's, I guess, my upset of the weekend. I don't know if it'll be an upset or not based on the way these teams have played lately, uh, but that's kind of my one prediction. Well, I don't know. We'll see. I might have another upset in for you here in a minute. But anyway, I think that LSU-Missouri series – Way more intriguing than any of us would have thought entering the. All right, finally, we get to what is probably the headliner series of the weekend. With apologies to Arkansas, South Carolina, I think this is the one that people are going to circle because Kentucky's 14 and one. Uh, if Kentucky keeps playing like this, it's going to break the all time SEC record for single season conference wins, which I think is held by Vandy with 26. But Kentucky, if it plays like this, has got a shot to challenge that record. But, boy, has it got a tough matchup with Tennessee. And stylistically, this is the most opposite matchup of the weekend that you will see. And I think this is the series that I'm probably more interested in watching than any of the other ones. Remember, this is in Kentucky's ballpark, uh, which Tennessee can be a little bit of a different team out of its ballpark, uh, which is kind of a bandbox, Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Now, that didn't hurt their pitchers too much, but – I think that team was built for that ballpark. So going on the road in an environment where Kentucky is going to try to take away everything that Tennessee does, going to be very interesting to see which style prevails here. Tennessee's lineup, I think top to bottom, one through seven or eight or nine, this might be the lineup that you don't want to pitch to more than anybody in the league. Now, look. I'm not saying it's the best lineup. Georgia may have a case, but I do think it's Tennessee. But here's my thing. I would rather pitch to a team that's got two or three superstars that you can pitch around a little bit than pitch to a team that just can batter you all up and down the lineup. And, and listen to these runs created estimates per 27 outs. Blake Burke, 17.7. Christian Moore, 12.2. Billy Amick, 14.8. Dean Curley, 11.7. Dylan Dryling, 14.5. Kavaris Tears, 15 and a half. Uh, Robin Villanueva, 12 and a half. Dalton Bargo, just over 11. I mean, this is a team that not only the guys that it's got out there, but some guys that it will bring off the bench can hit the long ball. And, and boy, this team can hit long balls. It leads the country. Tears has got 11. Dryling's got 13. Amick's got 12, and he's missed some time lately. Moore's got 15, and Burke has got 13. Also a team that walks a lot. Most of the guys in the lineup 
have got a double-digit walk rate. So probably some of that is just not wanting to pitch to those guys because if you leave one that catches a little bit too much plate, it could get out of the yard. Uh, but that's just life in terms of pitching to Tennessee. Um, the, the Vols pitching is not what it's been in the last couple of years. That doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, the Tennessee has made an interesting move. It's going to throw lefty Chris Stamos as, I guess, probably an opener in game one. He's only pitched 15 and two-thirds innings, but they've been good innings. They'll throw Drew Beam in game two, their ace, who's been in that spot a lot of the year. Not a strikeout guy, but a very durable guy who does not put a lot of guys on base. Same to be said of Xander Sechrist, who's their third starter. And A.J. Causey, who's gotten some starts, I guess will be pitching out of the pen this weekend. So uh, A.J. Russell's still out, who might have been their ace this year outside of Beam. But you look at the bullpen, Kirby Cannell, the lefties, put up a lot of innings lately. Nate Snead, a guy that's thrown 40 in the third innings, and they've been really good innings. He's a guy that can give you jumbo relief. They don't have as many guys who can get out as they did like the last two or three years, but they've got some guys who can go deep into games, like, like a Snead, like a Causey if you need him, like a Beam, uh, or even maybe Sechrist. And so I think that's going to be interesting to watch how Tennessee – pitches to Kentucky, which shockingly, hey, who had Kentucky being 14 and one at this point? Not me. Who had Kentucky leading the league and run scored in SEC play with 142? Not me. Oh, by the way, Kentucky's only given up 57 runs. This is a lineup that has just done some incredible things and a rotation that's been right there with the lineup in terms of how good it has been. Now again, this is this is a little bit like Tennessee to a lesser scale. This is a team that up and down in the lineup, not a lot of easy outs, but it does not have the pop that, say, the Vols lineup has. Ryan Nicholson, 11 home runs, the lefty transfer from Cincinnati. He's the only guy with double-digit home runs, but they got a lot of guys who can hit doubles and steal bases. Emilio and Petre, their second baseman, has stolen 19. Ryan Waldschmidt, their left fielder, has stolen 13 and gotten six bombs. And he just look up and down the lineup. It is a bunch of guys with on-base percentages at 400 or above or, or not further below who will hit, again, doubles and triples mostly, occasionally a home run. But uh, this lineup, just a, a tough one to pitch to because, boy, they will put some pressure on you and score some runs. And Tennessee has had some issues with that at times. The rotation, um, we talked about Arkansas earlier in the video. I don't know that Arkansas has had three guys uh, like Trey Poozer, Dominic Neiman, and Mason Moore who've given them uh, the innings that the Kentucky has. I remember a couple of weekends ago, all three of those guys went at least seven innings when they swept the series against um, – it was Alabama. And, uh, Arkansas might have done that, but here's the point. Seeing a team do that in this day and age of college baseball is really rare. And, and by the way, they got a ton of arms that they can bring out of the pen outside that. They got Johnny Hummel. Their closer, the transfer from Erskine, uh, who was a, kind of an unknown, who's just been dominant. He's got a 41% strikeout rate. They got a bunch of dudes after that who've been really productive. ERA's under three, Evan Byers, Robert Hogan, the Texas A&M transfer, Cameron O'Brien from Campbell. All those guys, 15 or more innings, ERA's under three. They've even got some guys like Ryan Hagenow, uh, Colby Frieda, who pitched for them in the past, that whether it's injury are just getting outperformed by other guys, aren't throwing as much. But um, this is a team that is really well balanced. It's hard to look at them and just find a weak link. So matchup of styles going to be very interesting. Kentucky so far has not lost an SEC game at home. Now the opponents have been, who's it been? It's been Alabama and it's been Georgia. So this team's actually had three road series, which which is really scary. You're sitting there looking up at Kentucky. This team is 14-1, and one, and three of its final series uh, of its five are going to be at home. And, oh, by the way, uh, the Cats beat Louisville in a slugfest this week, and I think it was 17-13 to 13 in the midweek game. So who wins this one? Uh, you've got teams that are just diametrically opposed and how they like to build offenses. I'm going to go with the upset and say Tennessee. Again, that is a tough challenge because Kentucky's guys keep the ball in the ground and out of the air. you got, I'm looking at it, of their top nine or ten arms, eight or nine of them have got ground ball rates north to 20%, which is pretty good. Again, that's all outs, not just balls hit in play. And so I think Kentucky's got a chance to neutralize 
what Tennessee's done, but it feels like Tennessee's been a little bit of a different team on the road. Uh, you remember last year, Tennessee got sent on the road to Clemson, and the Vols had played really well in Lindsey Nelson Stadium, uh, had not played so well on the road. They caught fire. They won that Clemson regional. They then went to Southern Miss, won a couple of there. So this is a team now that it feels like can can play well, not just in its own ballpark. Now, look, it, it has lost a series at Alabama, and it has lost one of three to Auburn in the only two road series it's had so far this year. So I'm taking a little bit of a gamble here. I'm thinking Kentucky can't probably continue to play at the level that it's played. But, hey, <laughs> don't get this twisted. Kentucky is a really, really good team, very much deserving of a national seed. I think these are two of the top probably four teams in the country right now. I'll call Tennessee in the upset just to, to spice it up a little bit. Anyway, we'll be back to wrap it up next week. We'll give you the recaps of what happened, and we'll do power rankings. So tune in for those. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. That'll help you get our content and get us seen. I'm Chris Lee. We are Southeastern 14 presented by Bet Online.